This is an intro level class to FlyQ. So we're going to begin at the very beginning, uh, which is to say to you, start the application. So you should have on your home screen, um, if you have FlyQ already installed, an icon with the magenta icon. This is FlyQ EFB. Tap it and it starts up, which is what I'm doing right now. And there you go. It automatically, if you have an iPad uh, that has a GPS in it, it should lock to your location and show you a blue dot. Like right now, the iPad is locked to my location. It's showing you where Seattle Avionics is located and so on. So let's kind of begin. But before I really do anything, I want to uh, stress that I'm not going to be able to cover everything today. It would be quite bewildering for those of you new to the product. Uh, so what I'm going to start off with is to show you how to get additional help. The first thing, of course, is that, as I said, we're doing about 20 or so different webinars this week, including later today, a more advanced version of this one. So if, uh, if you want to get more detail, you can sign up for the presentation, which is at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific time today. You can do that by going to seattleavionics.com dot wordpress dot sorry seattleavionics dot wordpress dot com and you'll find a list of webinars there the other way though is on the very top of the fly queue screen uh, next to where it says search for airports are a number of buttons there's one button towards about the middle of the screen that looks like a gear i'm going to press that right now because one of the things that that shows you is at the very top it says help so the first item is what's new in this version if you tap on that as you use various versions of the product, it tells you what's new in each particular release. I'm going to hit the close button in the left corner though. What's probably more interesting though, when you're learning the product is the second choice, which says technical support or help. I'm going to tap on that. And now you get a screen that has a number of things, including the pilot's guide and the top one, which is what I'm going to show you, videos. When you tap on the videos link, you'll find that on YouTube, we actually have over 80 different videos available. You can look at these simply with a web browser going to youtube.com slash flyqefb, or as I showed you here, hit the settings button, help, and then videos. There are a number of videos here. Probably the best ones for learning the product are down here in this category. This is called the playlist. It's a seven day challenge tutorials. What I'm going to be doing is an expanded version of kind of a, a short version of all of these combined. But when you look at the seven day tutorials, they're very short videos that cover very specific details like all the basics, downloading data, airport information, flight planning, and so on. So there's a lot more. In fact, I believe if I tap here, you see all the videos, the basics, flight planning, weather, IFR flying, et cetera. To get back, by the way, to, to do that, if you want to see all of the videos, at the top of that where it says seven day challenge tutorials, it's not hyperlinked. It's not obvious that you can click on it, but you can. If you click on seven day challenge tutorials, it brings you to the entire playlist so you can see all of those like that. Okay, now let's get back to FlyQ. I'll hit the close button to, well, close that. Hit the done button here, and let's begin with some of the basics of the product. The first thing is kind of the or overall screen orientation. This is not unlike most other iPad products. So at the top of the screen, you have a, a button that looks like a split, like a splitter. It's at the very top left corner, below where it says incorrectly, uh, 9:41 a.m. Tuesday, January 9th. Just below that, there's a button that will split the screen. If I tap on that, you see the screen split. We'll get into that a little bit later. Tap it again, it turns off. You can use the search box where it says search for airports to type in an airport ident. And I'll, again, I'll do all this in a second. Or create a flight plan there. Next to that is a lock button to lock the screen and so on. I'll get into what some of these buttons do a little bit later. But just know that at the top are features that are generally available no matter what screen you're in. These are at the top because they are commonly used. You want to be able to access them almost from any place in the product. Below that, is the beginning of a content area that is specific to the tab that we're on. Now, if I tap anywhere on the screen, you see a series at the very bottom of the screen, you see a bunch of tabs. The one that's blue in the middle says maps. It disappears, and I'm gonna tap it again. It stays on the screen by default for about six seconds so that it keeps the space for actually looking at real content like a map more clear. But anyway, so we're right now on the maps tab. The Maps tab has navigational information. So just below the part that says search for airports are a number of what we call gauges. The top one says alt altitude. 
in feet at 185 feet. So that's our elevation right now. Next to that, you have things like ground speed, track, the next waypoint since we have a flight plan on the screen and so on. All of these are customizable and time along, I'll show you how to do that. It's actually quite easy to do. So again, you then get into the main button and then if you tap on the screen to bring up the tab bar, which incidentally you can make permanent to the screen. There is a way in settings and I'll show you how to do that to make this on the screen at all times. But let's flip to the first tab that says airports. I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of all the tabs, then go into the detail of them a bit later. So in the airports view, we show you a list of all the airports based on your GPS location that are nearby. You can also sort that by hitting the sort button to sort by name, by weather conditions, by runway length, or even by fuel. We'll just do it by distance for now. Next tab is weather. So I just tap on the second tab down the bottom. And again, it shows you a lot of weather information. I'll show you more about the details of this in a moment. Next to that is what we call the flights tab. The flights tab is what we is a visual logbook. It shows you the flights that you took, it's a logbook, and all the flights that some of your friends have taken too. So there's a great way to work with other people on that. You then get back to the maps tab and continuing to move over, you have a plans tab. This shows you the flight plan that I have on the screen at the moment. You have a scratch pad next to it. In fact, it's a multi-pig scratch pad. So there's a button uh, towards the top right that has a one on it. If you tap the two next to it, you can type in something else, hit the back button and so on. So it's a multi-pig scratch pad. Next to the scratch pad on the bottom is a button that says procedures. We don't currently have a procedure up on the screen, uh, like an initial approach and so on. We'll do that in a little bit. And then next to procedures, we have documents, a lot of different documents. Now again, I'll get into the details. What I really just want to convey for the time being is simply that going from any screen to any other screen, it's just a matter of hitting one tab. You basically, from the tab bar, you can jump anywhere in the product to anywhere else in the product in essentially one tab. In fact, we call that the rule of two. What the rule of two means in FlyQ and what we think really differentiates FlyQ from most of the other apps out there is that we try to make it very, very quick. We want to fly the plane. We want you to fly the plane, not the iPad. It's pretty simple. And if you used a lot of the other apps out there, they may have a lot of features, which is fantastic. But if you have to do tap, 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 and then essentially drill down on hierarchical menus, it can take a while to get to things. We want to keep things very simple. I'll give you an example of that. If I were flying along here, uh, there's an airport towards the middle of the screen called PAE. This is Payne Field. This is the uh, closest major airport to us. It's the airport I learned to fly from. It's very pretty and so on. If I double tap on the screen here, you see a lot of information pull up immediately. It shows me, for example, then this little pop-up for a pain field. You immediately know a lot of information about this airport just from one double tap. I know, for example, by looking at the icon for a KPA that the airport is a controlled airport. It's blue. Uh, you know that it's green, meaning it's VFR weather conditions, which is great. So you have a good sense of what the weather is like already. You know that it's at about 9.7 nautical miles away from me, what the maximum runway length is, what the fuel price is, uh, when it was last updated a couple of days ago, what airspace class. And then you have a series of buttons below there where if you wanted to, you can immediately do a direct two. That's the first one on the left. Plus FP means add to my flight plan. So you can sequence that into my flight plan. It's already in my flight plan here, but you get the idea. If it's an airport that has approach plates, the next button that looks like a piece of paper is the approach plates. Or the final one on the right-hand side that looks like a map means put that airport on the map. So you see a lot of information simply by double tapping, kind of all the basics that you really need to fly to the airport are on the screen immediately. To dismiss this, you simply tap anywhere off that uh, gray pop-up, like on the background map, and so on. Very simple, very easy way to do that. The other thing I should point out that has to do with kind of the main screen is in the upper right corner of the screen, below the battery indicator that reads 100%, are a series of five uh, what we call status indicators. Two of them are green, three of them are black or clear right now. What does that mean? I'm gonna tap on them. If you tap on any of those five, they're small, so we don't try to make you hit it each one individually. But if you tap on any of the five, we show you what they mean. The top, the one on the far left, 
that's green says GPS means that your GPS is in fact connected and that you're getting uh, good updates on that. The one next to that that says WX, and you see it in big tabs down here, like that. The WX one, of course, means that you have weather, and it shows you the age of the weather and whether or not each particular weather element, and in this case, it would all be like this, comes from the internet, or if you're connected to any one of the about, I don't know, 30 ADSB receivers we work with, if it's coming from ADSB instead of the internet. If you were connected to an ADSB receiver, which I'm not right now, you would see uh, ADSB and the flight recorder light up. Okay, so those indicators there are green to give you a very, very quick update of things that are happening. You don't have to look down, you don't have to search any place in a settings menu or anything like that. You immediately know if there's a problem, the green will turn to bright red for any of those. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. The entire time uh, that I've been talking with a map on the screen, on the left side of the map is a gray button bar. It has, what, five buttons on it. The top one there is layers. So if I top, it looks like a stack of papers. So that will show me all the different layers I can put on the map. For example, I'm looking at my base layer as a sectional. If I'm IFR, I can set my base layer to that. If I prefer to fly, say, VFR, but not actually use a sectional, I can fly, say, on roads and you see a road layer, it downloads that one. I haven't pre-downloaded that. So you can take a look at the aerial view or you can look at the road layer like that. Then you can add anything you want to on top of it. By the way, to get rid of it, just tap off. So let me say, I'm gonna zoom the map out. Clearly I've got a couple of weather layers on. So as you can see, in the second uh, column that says weather, I have my radar turned on. It's a particularly nasty day right now in Seattle. So I can turn on my satellite visible layer and you see that everything turns, well, gray. This lets me, by the way, point, if I move the map out of the way, um, if I want to very quickly get back to my current location, this brings up that second icon on that toolbar on the left-hand side of the screen. So we talked a little bit about layers, but below the layers button is a button that looks a bit like a targeting site. I'm gonna tap on that right now. When I tap it once and it turns blue to show that it's locked on right now to my current location, it centers the map, but it doesn't zoom in. If we're already locked, like we are right now, that is you've already centered it, if you tap that same button a second time, it zooms into a much more reasonable location. In fact, let's now set this thing back to sectional. There we go. And reset the map a little bit. So again, that second button down there that looks like a targeting site does that for you. The third button has to do with track up versus north up. We're not moving yet uh, or simulating moving yet. So I'm not going to show that to you. One other button though, that I, and I'll show you in a little bit, the button that looks like a three dimensional cube, what that does. But below that is a button that's highlighted, it's in blue. That looks like, well, like a gauge indicator probably on your car or on your plane if you have steam gauges. The idea is for that to look, to toggle on and off the display at the top that says altitude 192, waypoint 8S2, nautical miles to waypoint, and so on. So if I tap on that, it turns off the gauge bar. If I, that's why the, the icon is now white, meaning off. If I tap on it again, it brings it back. Okay, simple enough. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other layers and then we'll move on uh, from there. So for example, if you were interested in weather because it's a crummy day like today, you can take a look at that weather column and turn on say METARs and TAFs. The way that FlyQ works, it's we like to keep things very, very, very simple. In fact, that's really kind of our whole big thing is simplicity. So green is good, red is bad, yellow or orange means in the middle. So I'm gonna turn off the radar for a second just to make this more clear. So you see another, a lot of dots on the screen. The dots are of course green or yellow and they are red. The green dots are VFR conditions. The yellow dots are marginal VFR conditions and the red dots are I, uh, IFR or low IFR. If you wanna see more detail on any of those, it's very simple. I'm gonna tap on one of the green dots, for example, and it gives me all the information about that particular airport. This also shows another great feature of the product. This is very, very big. This is very easy to read. One of the big features of FlyQ, in addition to that rule of two simplicity, that you shouldn't have to tap the screen a lot to get to information, we think it's kind of cool if when you tap on the screen to get information, you can actually read it. We know that most pilots out there 
um, are, let's say, not 18 years old, probably old enough to be wearing reading glasses, as I am right now. So we want to make sure that the text is nice and easy to read. Similarly, and I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but you can see the TAF and the METAR, bring it all up. Incidentally, um, if this is, of course, translated um, uh, METAR. If you prefer to read it in RAW, there's a switch right at the top. You go to RAW mode, much more compact. And if that's what you're used to, that's terrific. If you prefer the translated, just tap there. Very simple. If you tap off that, that is tap anywhere on the rest of the screen, not on that gray box, it goes away. Same thing with the red. So if I tap on one of the reds, it tells me it's low IFR and so on. Okay, a little bit of information about that. One of the things that when you're flying, of course, is you want to find information about airports, about weather, and so on. So how do we do that? Well, a couple of different ways. One I already showed you, that when you zoom into the map, if you double tap on a map location, it shows you information. Now, you, if you're coming from another product, you may say, well, why do I have to double tap? to get to information. That's because, how many times have you used an iPad in the cockpit? And just because it's a rough cockpit, uh, there's some turbulence, you're simply busy, you tap on the screen by mistake, and you see some silly little pop-up happen. So what we do is we make you double tap to be a bit more definitive that you really want information. That also lets us distinguish in other cases, I'll show you this in a second, between a single tap, which will bring up additional information on certain map layers, and a double tap, which will always uh, let you pick from information on a variety of places. Note also that when you do double tap on the map, there's a small tab bar at the bottom. What's highlighted in white right now says common. Common means that by default, when you double tap on the map, you see information about the airports and the nav aids. You don't see information about fixes because there's so darn many of them. You can filter that a little bit by tapping on one of those other tabs. So if I move from where it says in white common to the one next to it that says airport, you see only the airports, only the nav aids, or the, the next one is fixes. And of course, all of these are scrollable. And as before, you can do a, a direct to by hitting the direct to icon, uh, put it on the map, and so on. I'm going to tap off the screen. That dismiss that. That's one way to get information. But another one, we haven't talked about the search box yet. So what you do is you go into the search. And let's say that looking at the weather here, maybe I'd prefer to be in Miami right now. So I'm going to type in MIA. MIA, of course, could be either. I'll hit the enter key. MIA can be either um, an airport or a nav aid, or actually apparently multiple airports on here. So you see those listed for you. But if I really did care about Miami International, uh, let's go into a little bit more detail about that. So as I said, you can quickly do a direct to or plus FP at the flight plan or show an approach plate. But what I want to do right now is tap somewhere else where it says Miami International. That is all the rest of the text in that box. I'll tap somewhere there and I pull up quite a bit of information about Miami right now. I'm also going to use this opportunity to point out that if you're flying and while you're pulling up information about an airport, you'd like to see where you're going too. This is a great opportunity to use a split screen feature of the product. So I did this very quickly at the beginning, but let me remind you how that works. If you look at the upper left corner of the screen where it says 9.41 a.m., just below there is what looks like a rectangle that's split into two. I'm going to tap on that and now I see a split. I have a map on one side and I have airports on other. But you'll also notice that, let me tap on the map on the right side. The map button now has tab bar down the bottom that says maps, procedures, or documents at the bottom. Again, remember that disappears automatically. Similarly, if I tap on the left-hand side, it now says airport at the bottom. Airports, weather, flights, maps, uh, plans, search. So essentially what you can do is, each individual side of the screen, or if you have the iPad, and this is what's called landscape mode, wider than long. If you have it in what's called portrait mode, which is to say the iPad is taller than it is wide, then the two screens you can still use, but the two screens are stacked on top of one another instead. Same concept though. So right now we're in split screen mode. That's how you get to it. Just to make the presentation a little bit more clear, I'm gonna do a lot of this not in split screen mode. So I'm going to turn that off. And let's just look at the airports again. 
So again, remember that rule of two thing. We basically just tapped once on the screen and very quickly we have what's called a general tab. Next to general is weather, procedures, AFD, NOTAM, services, and so on. What, one of the things that's unique about FlyQ though, again, is that we want to show you the uh, relevant, the most important information first. So instead of making you dive into things uh, like stuff for runways or fixes or comp frequencies, all of that's really on the front page. And again, this is a very conscious design decision. So you get all the basics for Miami International. Its elevation is all of nine feet above sea level. Pattern altitudes, max runway, operating, fuel prices, and so on. And although we do have those tabs on the top that go general, weather, procedures, AFD, and so on, most of the, notice, first of all, that tab bar is very big. It's very easy to hit, even when you're in the plane. But for all the basic information, instead of making you hit a button, you simply take your finger and flick it up, which is what I did right now. So all the basics are here. I see a satellite view, two different diagrams, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. The comm frequencies you need and the runways, including a runway diagram, it tells you the crosswind component, the length, if it's right, if it's right or left pattern, and so on. Keep flicking, and you get to the nav aids, and so on. So all the basics that you really do need to get to that airport um, is right here on this first screen. You don't have to flick to one screen for comm frequencies, another screen for runways, and then from runways, tap again to see the details about that runway. All of that information is available to you on the screen at the same time. Again, a big design choice in FlyQ AFB. Now, I mentioned they want to go to Miami because the weather is crappy here in Seattle today. Great, so let's check the weather in Miami. The weather does deserve its own tab. So uh, below KIMA, in general, you see a tab button that says weather. I'll select that. And immediately what pops up onto the screen is a series of a uh, number of things. One, I know the current temperature is 73 degrees Fahrenheit. I know the expected high is supposed to be a little bit higher. If I'm not flying today and I want to see a forecast, well, since version one of FlyQ EFB, we've had a, a forecast. So I'll tap on seven day forecast and you see what the predicted weather is going to be like for the next seven days in plain English. In addition, you see a local, a regional and the national radar right in the middle of the screen. They were updated just a few minutes ago. If you want to see one of them bigger, for example, if I want to look at the regional one in full screen, I'm just going to tap on it or more full screen. It's animated so you get a good sense of which direction the weather is moving in. Clearly, if you're in Miami right now, there's not too much to worry about. Um, if you're in more of the central Atlantic states, maybe a bit more of an issue. I can tap off or hit the done button. Either one works to get rid of that. And again, you can look at a national or regional. If you want to look at the TAFs and the METARs, again, just like on the airport general, you simply flick up. Very, very, very simple to do this. So I now see my METARs on the left side and my TAFs on the right side. So again, you don't have a separate tab for METARs or a separate for TAF. I've mentioned a few times that FlyQ is very big on designing things for people who wear reading glasses, which is to say most pilots that I know. And you may say to yourself, well, that text on the screen there, Steve, that looks maybe a little bit small. How do we make that bigger? Very simple. On all the text blocks connected to the, to the METARs or the TAF, I'm going to tap on, just tap anywhere in there. So I'm going to tap on the METAR on the left side. Now, I'd be willing to bet that anybody out there looking at that on their iPad can read that even without reading glasses. And of course, if it's a little longer, like a, do the same thing with the TAF. If it's a little bit longer, I'm just flick it up. Okay, very simple, very, very easy to do. And again, you can do it in raw, which may make it a bit more compact or translated, whichever one you prefer to dismiss it, either tap off the pop-up or click the done button in the upper left corner. I like that. Winds aloft. Just scroll down a little bit and it's all there. So all the weather that you want to see, including the temperature and the direction that the wind is and the velocity is there for you. In fact, we even get a weather briefing automatically throughout the system. And if you want to read that, again, tap on it and you see it. You can scroll through the entire official weather briefing and so on. Very, very easy to do. Again, click the done button and that closes it. So that's how we get to weather. Weather is incredibly simple to get to in the product. And on one screen, you see all of the information that you generally want to to get there. 
Now let's say that you're flying um, IFR. Let's see what it looks like to look at a procedure. When I look at the procedures, we list the procedures uh, with a color button, a color, low color icon next to it. The green means it's been downloaded. In this case, I've gone ahead and I'll show you how to do this in a second. Um, I've already downloaded the data for these states. So I know that the data for Florida and I took the entire West Coast is downloaded. Otherwise, the colored icon next to each of these plates may be red, meaning not downloaded. If I tap on any of them, I simply see it. Very easy to see. Then if I just, again, keeping it very simple, if I take one finger and I swipe left or I swipe right, it moves on to the next approach plate. Very easy. You can also put that on the map. On the right-hand side towards the middle of that icon is, uh, rather, uh, of the diagram, is an icon that looks like a map. If you tap on that, you put it on the map. I'm going to hit the Layers button and just turn off uh, some of the other things. But now you see the approach on this. And let me turn off uh, what's called the Runways Layers, too. So now that particular approach plate's on the screen. And here's a slick thing, too. If I tap that split screen button again, so I'm looking at, I'm going to hit the Procedures tab on the right side. So if I'm looking at this procedure on the right-hand side of the screen, I see it on the right, but I also see it on the left-hand side. If I flip now on the right-hand side to another approach plate, see what happens to the map? The map updates also with the different approach plates. In fact, it even gets better than that. One of the other features that's built into the approach plate, um, in fact, let me do this. Let me pull up. Let me do two things. A little button bar pops up on the approach plate. It'll disappear in a few moments, as it did, to give you more space to look at the approach plate. But if I hit the button that looks like uh, three line items, this gives you an entire list of things. If you have a very large airport like Miami International, which you know personally I don't really fly to in a Cessna very often, but you can use that to flick through to all the different procedures there. I'm going to pick on the FAA airport diagram tap off to see it. And if I want to draw on this plate, I can do that quite easily too. I tap to pull up um, my tools. The bottom one looks like a scribble thing, like a magic marker. And now I've got a list of tools that I can use to do things like circle, you know, like here, don't go here. You can change the color with a toolbar on the other side and so on. Now here's the fun part too. If I were to put this on the map, so I'm going to turn off the scribble mode by just tapping it again, and then put this thing on the map, which you can do in a couple different ways. Oh, it already is on the map. Let's zoom into Miami. Oh, oh that's weird. That's kind of unusual. Most of the airport diagrams are geo-referenced. This particular one wasn't, which is actually a positive thing. What that means is that the team here found that the geo-referencing on Miami doesn't work for it. Here's another diagram, though. This is the Seattle Avionics diagram. As you can see, the Seattle Avionics diagrams not only have on them uh, the same sort of information with the runways and such. I'm going to zoom this in. But at the bottom of the screen, you see information about where all the FBOs and such are. And those are called out in numbers. So very easy way to do it. So you can not only put things on the screen, but again, if you were to do some scribbling on here, like you don't want to land on this runway. When I turn the scribble mode off, notice that the scribble I just made on the right side also appears on the left side of the screen. Okay, so a lot that you can look at there. Let's talk about flight planning now. I'm going to hit the button that takes me out of split screen mode. So again, that's the part that says 941 in the upper left corner. It's blue now, meaning split, split mode is on. If I tap it again, I go back into single screen mode, which is just a little bit easier for some of this. And let's talk about flight planning. So to plan a flight, there are a few different ways to do this. One, the easiest way, though, I'm going to cover right now, we have some more advanced classes that uh, will show you some of the details, but I'm just going to keep it simple for the time being. So in the search box uh, towards the upper left corner, it now says MIA. I'm going to tap in that box and click the little X uh, there to clear that. And I'm going to do a flight from my home airport, which is PAE. And we're going to go down to one of my favorite cities, San, San Francisco. By the way, I, you can type in the K if you really want to. You can type in KPAE, KSFO, but in most cases, there's no need to. On my keyboard, there's a blue search button. I'll tap on that. 
The system, whether you're connected to the internet as I am now, or if you're um, in flight, will create the flight plan for you. And not only does it just create the flight plan, it will create the flight plan uh, by taking a look at the optimal winds to give you the right altitudes to fly at, and it'll give you the, um, if necessary, like is the case here, it will also automatically add fuel. So you'll notice that it added uh, fuel because you see an airport icon in the middle of my flight plan at 3S8 right there on the screen. So all of that was done for you automatically. The altitudes that you see are altitudes that the system picked uh, to give me maximum uh, performance. So something else I should notice before we leave the screen, if you think those fonts are maybe a little bit small for you, again, we, we really do focus on uh, font size. If you take a look at the nav log tab, which we're on now, there's a little letter A and a big letter A, the word wind optimizer, reverse, clear, and edit. So let's hit the one that looks like a little A and a big A. And now the fonts get quite a lot larger. It's a very easy, very simple thing to do. If we had this flight plan and we want to look at it, there's a, a small, um, below the status indicator, there's a small icon that looks like a map. I tap on that and that brings the map in such that it's zoomed out appropriately. As we continue zooming in, you see more and more detail. So the fixes and the airports and the nav aids come in, but at a distance, you just see the line. Okay, so let's actually try uh, rubber banding the flight a little bit. So let's say that you were looking at this and you don't want to fly through this area. You don't want to fly to Dibble, for example. You want to fly to someplace else, fine. Easy to do that. If you press and hold on the magenta line or on a fix like Dibble, I'm gonna press and hold on the line and now I have a new magenta line and I can move that to wherever I feel like. Just drag and drop that. And then when you drag and drop it, it says, well, did you mean exactly there? Like, do you want that exact latitude and longitude point or do you want something like a fix that's vaguely nearby? I'm gonna pick my fix. So now you can see the fix here is Walbo. So right now the flight plan got changed from uh, wherever we were, uh, going direct to Dibble. We're now going to Walbo before we hit Dibble. That's pretty funny. Say that five times fast. Walbo, Dibble, Walbo, Dibble, anyway. So that's how you do the rubber banding. It's very simple. If you want to lead a point, it's also very simple. So if you decide that Walbo is in fact not where you want to go because you're in the middle of an MOA, you can press and hold on that and the system pops up the same kind of do you want to pick a waypoint, but if you notice in the upper right-hand corner of the pop-up, it has the word delete. I'm going to click delete. When I do that, Wallabo goes away and we're flying direct to Dibble once again. So just one way of uh, doing a flight plan, it's pretty simple. I want to show you though, a couple of other things about weather. So we turned on a couple of the weather layers, but there's quite a lot more to it. So let's go back to the tabs at the bottom of the screen. Again, to do that, I tap anywhere in the map and the tab bar pops up. I'll pick the second from the right, second from the left rather, one that says weather. This is very similar to what you saw for an airport, but now this is based on our current location. What, the reason why I'm showing it to you though, is if you take a look towards the top where it says nearby, and then a winds tab and a gallery tab and a search tab, I'm gonna pick the third one, gallery. So in the gallery tab, you have a choice of uh, static weather images that come from either NAV Canada or from uh, NOAA in the US. So I tap on the US. Up pops um, a menu here where I can take a look at things like freezing levels, three, four, six hour forecast. Tap on any of those and you see it big. If you notice, it's a little hard to see, but if you notice, there's an arrow on the left side and on the right side. If I click on those arrows, I go to the next graphic. So you don't have to pop back to the previous menu level, kind of handy. If you tap off the pop-up or hit the done button, you go back to this. I'll hit now, if you look at the line that says freezing levels, on the left-hand side, there's a fairly standard back button. So if I click the back button, I go back and let's say I want to look at icing potential. I click on icing potential and maybe since we're flying at 7,000 feet, let's tap on the 7,000 foot one. If we're thinking maybe we want to fly a little bit lower, I'll hit the button on the left that looks like to the back. I'll go lower to, I think, what, 5,000 feet? Then from 5,000 down to 3,000 and so on. Again, click done and you're done. So at this point, we've done a little bit of information about looking at some of the weather. Let's go ahead and file this flight plan. So to do that, I hit my plans tab towards the middle of the screen. 
again, we're looking at that nav log. Uh, first thing to notice, by the way, is if you wanted to, you can change the takeoff time. Anything that's blue, you can click on, just like a link on a web page. So if I want to change my takeoff time, I just tap on that and pick, you know, with a little slider, whatever time I want. If I have more than one pilot or more than one type of plane, I can tap on the plane or the pilot. If I want to change from, my default was set up to be VFR. If I want to change this to an IFR flight, I can change VFR to IFR. By the way, watch the altitudes here. So I'm going to change this to IFR. And notice that the altitudes change from uh, 500 foot increments to 1,000 foot increments. So it automatically adapted that to it. If you take a look, if you want to get an actual weather briefing for this, very easy to do. You just tap on the WX tab and look at that. You now have an official weather briefing as done through LATOS. So you've now been officially briefed on it with very, very little work to do. If you want to file the flight plan, we use the ICAO flight plan filing. So the third tab where it says nav log, WX brief, the third one on the right side is ICAO plan. So I tap on ICAO plan. If I wanted to, anything that's in white as opposed to light gray, it may be hard for you to see, but hopefully you can. Anything that's white is editable, so you can just tap on it to change it. When it's the way that you want it though, there's a blue button, a blue word that says file on the left hand side, or right below the word navlog. I'm going to click the file button and file my flight plan. At this point, I have in fact successfully fly, filed an IFR flight plan. All of the information is there. It's been filed with LATOS. I'm done. Cool thing, by the way, on LATOS, if you tell LATOS to connect to FlyQ, and that's covered in one of the videos that we have on YouTube, and it's really quite easy, but um, if you have that configured, this LATOS will automatically send you a text message uh, that gives you a link to close the flight plan later. We'll also, I believe, give you, at least optionally, alerts so that if something happens to your flight plan, like there's adverse weather conditions and so on, it will notify you of that via text message too. So pretty slick. Okay, so we'll close that. And let's begin, uh, we won't have too much longer, but I wanna show you what it's like a little bit to fly the, fly the flight. Now, FlyQ automatically hooks up to most of the electronics that you would have in your cockpit. We hook up to 20 or 30, I don't know, something like that, ADSB receivers. We, co we connect automatically. If you have a Dynon Skyview, we connect to that Wi-Fi. If you have an advanced flight systems uh, system, we connect to that. If you have a Bendix King AeroView Touch or Bendix King XView Touch, we connect to that. Um, if you have an Avidyne IFD, we connect to the Avidyne IFD. A lot of different things that we connect to very easily, very automatically, and it'll get data from there. So this system is automatically driven by that. Or if you like to practice in the winter time uh, using something like X-Plane uh, Pre uh, Prepare 3D or Microsoft X-Plane, uh, Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator rather, you can do that and we hook to it. Also, we have a built-in simulator in the product. So at, towards the beginning of the presentation, I tapped on those five buttons at the upper right corner of the screen, the ones that have a green GPS and a green WX and then some other buttons. I'm going to tap on those again and flip. There's a number of different categories here. I'm going to flip it to the GPS category. And you notice that the first thing you see listed there says simulator. So I'm going to turn on my simulator. I'm going to tap off that and just go to the map. And now you can see we start to fly the plane. The plane icon is simulating flight. All the gauges at the top of the screen have lit up. We're now at 1,000 feet and climbing, ground speed 85 knots, track 167, and so on. But let's say we want to be a little bit elsewhere in the flight. I'm going to tap again on that status indicator in the far right corner of the screen. And notice I have a couple of sliders. I can make the whole thing go faster by changing the speed. Uh, some of us here are sci-fi fans, so we like to call this the warp speed switch. Go up to warp 10 if you want to, or five. You can also move to either any particular waypoint in the flight. Like if I want to move to BTG, that's battleground, I can just tap on BTG and the flight automatically moves to that point. Or going back to the simulator, I can move the slider that says position on route to, well, anywhere I want to on the route, just like that. Okay. But actually, Battleground isn't a bad place to be. So I'll t uh, tap on Battleground here. So at this point, it's easy to see how the system works when flying. One of the things that's really great about flying, too, 
is that it gives me the chance to show some of the in-flight capabilities of the product. So let's take a look at one of them that's one of my favorites. Uh, in fact, two of them. I'm gonna go back into split screen mode by hitting that button on the upper, upper left side. And I, what this is doing now is I'm gonna put a map on the right side by hitting the map tab. And on the, uh, the left side, I'm gonna hit airports and then hit nearby. What this is doing now is pretty slick. Right now, of course, I'm physically not near Pearson Field, Vancouver, Washington, but the simulator is. So what this is doing is it's automatically uh, updating the nearest airports with my current position. And this will change. So notice it says 3.9 nautical miles from Pearson Field. In a couple of seconds, that should change. There it goes. Now, the whole situation changed because as we continue to fly, we're now no longer near that same airport. So Pearson Field is now 2.2 nautical miles away. This is super nice in case of emergency. Uh, I fly like this a lot because in case of an emergency, I don't want to try to figure out what the nearest airport is or you know what the weather conditions are at the airport. That's on the screen the whole time, just there waiting for me. So very, very simple, easy thing to do. One of my other favorite things to do though, is as you're flying along, now we all know that you know the takeoff and the landing are the most difficult and the most, let's say, exciting sometimes part of a flight. But generally speaking, while you're just flying along in cruise, there's not a huge amount to do. And frequently what's running through your mind is, should I be flying lower? Should I be flying higher? Fly Q is there to help you. What we do is I'm gonna take on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm gonna go to my weather tab, not the gallery, but rather uh, there's a button there that says uh, below the word weather, it says nearby winds gallery search and recent. The one to the left hand side of gallery is winds. Check this out. When I tap on winds, I see life is bad. Basically, I see lots of red. Remember, as with all things in the product, red is bad, green is good. So when I take a look at red, that means that bar graph down below there is showing me that I have a headwind a red wind at all the altitudes I'm at. So right now, if you take a look at the gauge on the left, on the right hand side of the screen, we have a map. It says my current simulated altitude is 7,000 feet. So if you look at the left hand side, at the uh, kind of a histogram or bar graph there, you see that there's a, a gray bar between six and between the six and the eight. That means between 6,000 and 8,000 feet. So that's again showing us that the winds right now are probably something on the order of 26, 27 miles an hour as a headwind. You can also see that by looking at the graphic at the top of the wind indicator on the left-hand side. You pretty clearly have an orange, which means again, kind of in the middle, green would be a light wind, red would be a super heavy wind, uh, and orange is kind of in the middle. So we have a 31 knot wind heading, uh, well, it's hitting us pretty much directly in our nose. Let's see though if the weather is gonna get a little bit better in the simulator if we were to move on. So let's change the position in the route to maybe closer to San Francisco. Oh, much nicer. So in San Francisco, the weather is apparently a lot better, or at least the winds are a lot better. So we know that we're seeing a lot of green. Green is good. So interestingly, um, the system picks the altitudes that are right for us. And in this case, it's pretty good. So the bigger the bar, the more of something. So in this case, we know that if we were to fly down to about 6,000 feet, we'd be able to pick up even a little bit more speed. Uh, we'd be going, it looks like the winds aloft at uh, 8,000 feet are giving us an 11 knot tailwind green, and at 6,000 feet are giving us a 13 knot tailwind. So if possible and if convenient and safe, we may want to fly just a tiny bit lower, okay? So that's a really super useful feature that's built into the product. A Couple of other things. Let's say that you want to download data in the product. FlyQ can, of course, if you're connected to a cell tower while you're flying, it can connect to it. Um, my screen just changed. Did somebody do something? Uh, okay, uh, sounds like someone just decided to put a pull up. Maybe we can not do that and go back to the presentation be great. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're back to the presentation. And what we're doing right now is I want to take a look at some of the other features. I talked about uh, downloading data. When you fly along in the product, of course, you uh, 
you can't generally download any data that is maps, approach plates, weather, all that kind of great stuff. The most useful thing to be able to do then is to download that before you fly. So let me show you how you do that. Towards the top of the screen, I said there are a number of buttons that are used. Uh, well, first of all, let's go out of split screen mode, just to make everything a little bit clearer. Uh, the top of the screen have buttons on there that help you do things generally with a product. There's a button towards the middle of the top that looks like a down arrow. I'm going to click on that. And when you click on the down arrow button, you see something on the screen that looks, well, like a map. It's very straightforward. So as you take a look at the map, you see a magenta line. What does the magenta line mean? Oh, right. Remember, we're flying from the Seattle area down to San Francisco. So that magenta line is on the screen to give us a good hint of the data that we need to download. So this is super useful. If let's say that we're flying on the West Coast, uh, but if we're flying on the East Coast, unless you're super, super good at geography, it's pretty easy to plan a flight on the East Coast covering a lot of states and you may nick a state or you come very close to a state and, you're not, and you don't quite realize it. So instead of picking from an alphabetical list of states to download data from, uh, you just pick one. So for example, if I were doing this flight and I'm going to pass through New York, I just tap on New York. If I were doing a flight in the Midwest and I need to go to Missouri, I tap on Missouri. Very easy. Now it's red. That's not a political statement. This isn't red versus blue, like for Republicans and Democrats or anything. Red simply means it's not downloaded, right? Red is bad, green is good. So the green states have already been downloaded, the red states have not been downloaded. If when it's time to actually download them, you just hit the update now button and you'll skip the green states because why? We already have them. And it'll just download Missouri and New York. So very simple, very easy way to take a look at that. Also, if you scroll this down a little bit, you can pick from the different data products that you download. So the data products are pretty straightforward. Um, it will automatically, by the way, download TFRs and fuel prices, the two towards the top and the digital data. But you can turn on and off airport diagrams, AFDs, the Seattle avionics diagrams, VFR terminal procedures, and so on. So by default, we download the sectionals and the IFR low charts. We do not download the IFR high charts. So if you want to download those, you simply tap on the button next to IFR high, and you make it green, just like that. Similarly, if you fly in the Gulf of Mexico, or if you fly a helicopter, you can turn on those. So pretty easy way to do that. I'm not going to hit done now because I don't want to interrupt the presentation. Um, so no update now, I'm just going to hit done. By the way, it is possible to download data by hitting update now, and then uh, you can continue using the rest of the program. So if you're doing some pre-flight planning and you want to download some data, by all means download the data, then continue on with your planning. You don't have to stay on the screen even when you're downloading data. I'm going to hit done, and there you go. So we're back to the screen that we're at in a go. Similarly, by the way, I'm going to go back to my flights area, or rather to my plans tab. And uh, when we created this flight plan, a little message popped up telling us that, hey, you may need to download data for this flight. Another way to get to that is, again, to look at the buttons on the top there. And next to the download button that we just looked at is a button that looks like an aircraft taking off. That's our pre-flight checklist. I'm going to tap on that, and it immediately shows you things like uh, whether or not using, again, green or red, whether the GPS is available, whether the weather is current, um, and so on. If there's anything red, oh, right. So we selected IFR high charts, but we didn't download them. Bummer. So that's telling us that we need to do that. Cool thing here, though, is if I were to hit the download button now, it's only going to download the data we need along our flight plan. So although I've select, I have a flight plan now from Washington State down to California, and I've also selected places like New York, uh, Kansas, Missouri, Miami, uh, Florida, and so on, it's not going to download the IFR charts that are way out of our flight plan. So you won't get the ones for New York, for Kansas, for Missouri, or for Florida. You're only going to get the IFR high charts for Washington, Oregon, and California. So that's a, a little bit of a difference here. If you're familiar with some other products, it's, it's sometimes called uh, something like packing for the flight or something like that. But this is a pre-flight checklist and we actually invented it and did it before anyone else did. So it's a couple of things there. Um, I want to show you also a few, just a little tiny things. I'm going to go back to the gauges because it's sometimes really useful to change the gauges on the screen. Again, the gauges are indicators at the top, the things that say 7,000, 
ground speed 115, next waypoint, and so on. First, there's a timer there. So on the right-hand side, I can just tap on that and say start. I'm starting up a timer now. But let's say you didn't, next to the timer, timer one is stopwatch one. Let's say that I don't actually need um, the stopwatch. If I press and hold on any gauge, I can change it to any other gauge. So I'm going to press and hold and turn this into something like, oh, here's a neat one, vertical speed required. With the VSR one, that tells me if I were really coming in for landing at the airport, how far I need to go down, how fast in feet per minute I need to go down to hit pattern altitude for my next airport. Again, you can press and hold and pick something like, um, oh, what? You can do estimate time before landing. So it looks like we have in the simulated flight here about an hour and 16 minutes before we land and so on. The system, by the way, I'm going to put this into split screen mode here. You can separately customize uh, the screens. So, for example, I can have maybe my AGL gauge on for some reason. I can customize what's on the left and what's on the right separately. And that's separate from the full screen mode. So in full screen, we have our timer and we have ETE. And then you go into split screen mode. It remembers, though, that I configured these gauges a little bit differently. You can also look at gauges like this. Um, in an approach plate. So if we were looking, I'm just flicking through these now. If we were doing an approach, in fact, tell you what, let's say I'm going to pull up an approach in the area. So I'm going to pull up Hague Field right here, and I'm going to put that one um, on here. So I'm going to pull up a procedure. It looks like we have a VOR approach, and um, try to move the simulator a little bit closer maybe to where that is. Um, that's unfortunate. Well, I was going to show you something called georeferencing. A georeference thing means that if I were looking at a map, oh, I'm just off it. Okay. Let's see if I can move the simulator just a little. This is pretty, uh, this is very useful. Okay. So now, yeah, that should be there. So the, the point here basically is that when you put the approach plate on the map, you can see it um, on your screen like this. I'll go into single screen mode and you can see it there. You can make that either very transparent. Right now it's semi-transparent. Um, so a lot of different ways that you can do that. Other things that you can do, let's just talk finally, uh, just before I close, about some of the buttons at the top of the screen. So again, we talked about what the download button does. This is one that's super useful. It's the, the button that looks like a padlock is just that, it's a lock. I turn that on by tapping on it. What that means is, no matter, trust me, I'm touching the screen right now. I can touch the screen. I can even take my iPad and rotate it around. I just rotate it at 90 degrees. And the iPad didn't actually move because the lock button is there to make sure that if you're on landing or if you're in high turbulence or something, hitting the screen by default doesn't do anything. So I just turn the lock off to do that. You can change next to the lock button as a button that looks kind of like a brightness control. You can change the screen brightness, the radar opacity, or in this case, procedures on the map opacity. I can make it, right now it's kind of in the middle. I can make that procedure rock solid, or I slide it the other way, and I can make it barely legible. Okay, totally up to you how you want to do it. We talked about the download button, the down arrow, and the pre-flight. Settings, um, I'll talk about a little bit later, but let's say that you were flying at night. There's a button that looks like it's half black, half white, if I tap on that, the system goes into night mode. And in night mode, what it actually does is it doesn't just invert all the colors on the screen. I'm going to turn on another map layer, TAWS, for example. So you can see that the TAWS layer uh, uses yellow to mean that you're within 1,000 feet, and the kind of reddish orange means that that particular train is at or above your current altitude, so you probably don't want to hit it. But it doesn't invert all the colors on the screen. It simply turns anything that's white to black, anything that's black to white or kind of in the gray scale. But things that are actual colors, like if I also turn on, say, my METAR layer, those are the right colors for them as well. Okay. So that I think gives you a good sense for what you can do with the product. There's lots of other features that we'll discuss in the advanced presentation. The advanced presentation is at uh, two o'clock Pacific time today. One final feature, just because I think it's cool. If you want to know the distance between any two points, you can take two fingers on the map. Press and hold on the map like this, and check that out. You now see what we call terrain x-ray, meaning right now we know at the altitude is 7,000 feet. So that on the map is telling us, you can see the red there, 
where it says 9308. That's a maximum altitude on the line that I just drew with my two fingers. And clearly most of that's green, but you see some red, meaning you would hit it if you do that. You can grab either the left or the right side and just move that as well, which is pretty slick. And then finally, if you want to look at the map in, right now we've spent a lot of time in 2D mode. You can also move it to 3D mode by hitting the cube button in the uh, lower left side of the screen there, it's a cube button. The cube now means we're in 3D mode, so you see these highway in the sky boxes. Or, in fact, if you tap it a third time, you get into what we call augmented reality mode. If you're actually flying, not sitting at your desk in Seattle, you would see airports that are nearby you are being highlighted like this. So if the weather conditions are really bad, you can know that uh, 008 is 17 nautical miles away. And since it's uh, pink, you know it's an uncontrolled tower. You know we're now hitting south and so on. So a lot of cool things there. That's the augmented reality mode. And you get to that simply by hitting the 3D cube button. If you tap it again, it's kind of a three-way switch. It goes between 2D mode, tap it again, you get 3D. Tap it a third time, you get augmented reality. And then tap it again and you go back to 2D. So I hope that's given you some sense of what the product can do.